Yeah, I know it. I don't want it. It's, you got two emails, Emmanuel Mitchell, if you're here. Get rid of one, will you, please? Um, Carmel? He did it? When? Okay, it didn't show up, so we'll keep an eye on it. Yeah. Masa. Orinato. Prince. Ristelli. Sean Reynolds. Tom Reynolds, who showed me his certificate that he did it. Roberto. And that's it. You guys have to, you have to get it done. If you're having a problem, please contact me. All right. Go to the awards. If you look at the, you look at your uh, roster book, you'll see the different guys with the awards out there. Uh, 35 year for you guys was uh, Fireship, Giovanetti, Farrell, and Riley. Riley, congratulations, gentlemen. We also have, we also have um, Pete Brandt, who will be getting a ring at the States. For, and, a plaque, and, a plaque. and a plaque, excuse me, and a plaque. With his picture on it. And we, huh? Oh, what the heck, it's a. Uh, and let's see what else we got here. And Guy Moriello. Well, you're on the thing for the girls' division. You get the picture. You get the picture. It's, uh, I didn't want to hear that. It's Zach Papa, you're also there for the state finals. So, everybody, congratulations on that. And my final award goes to Mr. Michael Williams. Would you please come down here? Michael Williams gets the watch. 30 years. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. All right. You guys, the, the, the roster book is out. Please look at it and send me an email and tell me what's wrong, if, 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 any, if something's wrong, so I can fix it for next year. All right. If anybody's had any questions, I don't want to hold you up. Get me later on. Once again, Thank you very much for all the support that you did. I had, uh, I just finished chemo about five weeks ago, and from that was from January. So, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, I also forgot to mention we have uh, Tony Tabaccino here for uh, um, for us uh, tonight as well. One of the national rules um, guys. He's our regional rules interpreter for the Northeast, or section one, whatever that be, seven states from Maine down to uh, Maryland or Virginia, or whatever, I, I don't know exact, uh, uh, but. <laughs> uh, so we're blessed to have a guy like Tony also uh, with us. Very blessed. Um, so thanks for coming down. The next person I wanna bring up real quick here is um, Mark Sherman, our uh, coordinator of Thank you. I'll be brief, guys. We have a long night. First of all, the test hopefully is going to open one minute after midnight on Friday, which will be Saturday morning at 12.01. I spoke to Tony Maselli. He assured me that it would be posted at that time. And it closes uh, the first uh, Saturday, first Friday in December. Hopefully that'll be up there. Also, in your packets, you will have a uh, roster book that was put in here. We just got those today. But also you have a raffle book. Please make an effort to sell at least one raffle book. You know the association, we work at a deficit, and we want to see if we can get everybody to please sell one raffle book. The cadet program is very, very good, very strong. We have a lot of support this year coming in each and every chapter of the seven sites that we have. And we also this year for the first time, which I'm very, very pleased to say, we have six girls signed up in our official, officials program. And hopefully they will project and become varsity officials in the very near future. Billy. Thank you, Mark. Um, next, I'll turn it over to Larry White from the NJSIA has a couple of words and uh, we'll continue with the introductions and uh, then we'll start the presentation. Thanks, Bill. 
Uh, really, I don't have that much to say because I want to get to the um, to the presentation real quickly, and then you guys. I know you have a um, the rules interpretation part. There's a, quite a few rules. I know that uh, Joe's going to, you know, do a great job as our rules interpreter. Uh, but at this point, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Miss Alexis Franklin. She is a legal specialist that works for the Division of Civil Rights through the Attorney General's Office of the State of New Jersey. She's been in that position for two years now. She will give a presentation on race discrimination based on hairstyles. And when Ms. Franklin is finished, then we'll turn it over to the, the chapter and to Bill, okay? Well, thank you for having me at your meeting tonight. I will be brief because from what I've heard, you have a lot to go through tonight. So, um, yes, my name is Alexis Franklin. I work with the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights. Um, so what is DCR? We're a state agency. We enforce the law against discrimination, which I'll talk to you a little bit about more in a second, and also the New Jersey Family Leave Act. We have offices in Newark, Trenton, Cherry Hill, and Atlantic City. Um, the LAD that we're gonna talk about is a state law. It prohibits discrimination and harassment in housing, employment, and places of public accommodations, such as public schools. Um, it, it protects, um, <laughs> it prohibits discrimination on the basis of protected characteristics, such as race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, national origin, disability, and there are a number of others as well. Um, so in response to an incident that involved a mixed race wrestler um, having his locks cut prior to a match, DCR and NJSIAA issued a memorandum of understanding or an MOU in September of 2019. It stated that both organizations are committed to ensuring that wrestling officials, coaches, and athletic personnel in New Jersey um, interpret Rule 4.2.1 in a way that doesn't discriminate against black wrestlers. Uh, both organizations are also, I'm sorry, both organizations are also committed to eliminating any interpretation of Rule 4.2.1 that would um, allow traditionally black hairstyles to be deemed unnatural or that would subject wrestlers with these hairstyles to differential treatment um, as to when a hair cover was required. So DCR, in addition to the MOU, also issued a guidance document um, that's called, appropriately, Guidance on Race Discrimination Based on Hairstyle. Um, it clarified that the LAD prohibits discrimination based on hairstyles that are, quote, inextricably intertwined or closely associated with race. So what does that mean? There, that covers certain black hairstyles, such as twists, braids, cornrows, afros, locks, bantu knots, and fades. Um, and just as a, a quick note, we don't refer to locks as dreadlocks because there's some controversy about the origin of the term. So those are some of the um, hairstyles that are covered. Uh, so I'm gonna give you real quick a little background on hair discrimination and why we needed a guided document in the first place. And then we'll talk about how the document and hair dis discrimination may impact you and your role as an official. So there are a number of stereotypes that are associated with black hair. Um, some of the stereotypes are that black hairstyles are dirty, uh, dreadlocks have been, or locks have been associated with smoking weed, they're unkempt, they're criminal, uh, if you wear certain hairstyles you're impoverished or unprofessional. Um, some examples of this are, there's an actress up top on the left, her name's Zendaya, and she wore locks on, on the red carpet and a TV host said she looks like she smells like patchouli oil or weed. Um, in 2014, the army actually banned locks and called them matted and unkempt. They eventually uh, rescinded that ban, but it happened. Um, an 11-year-old, he was kicked out of school because the school felt that his cornrows might be gang-related. Um, this woman here, she was a Banana Republic employee. She was suspended for wearing braids. Her manager said that they were unprofessional, unkempt, too urban. And finally, on the bottom here, this woman, she worked for QVC. She was modeling a purse. And again, one of the hosts said um, when she was 
modeling, why did I wear my hair like that? She said, you might look back and think, why did I wear my hair like that? But you'll still like your purse. Um, so those are some of the stereotypes. But why do the stereotypes matter? Um, discrimination, it causes dignitary, physiological, and financial harm. As a result of some of the stereotypes uh, that black people have had to deal with surrounding their hair, many have felt pressured to change their hair to meet European standards. Some of them wear wigs or weaves or straighten it with heat or chemicals. Um, in this picture to the left, a woman has hair, had her hair braided and then she's getting human hair or synthetic hair actually sewn into her hair. And just in case you think this is just like a, a female issue, men are subject to these stereotypes too. Um, this gentleman on the right, he has what's called a texturizer in his hair to loosen the curls or make it more manageable. Um, and I checked around in my office and I asked some of my coworkers, did you ever put that in your hair? And they said, yeah, I did in high school. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not just a thing that impacts women. Um, the problem with these processes are they're often painful. You can get a, a heat burn or a chemical burn. Um, they're damaging to the hair and scalp, and many of these techniques are time-consuming and expensive. Um, additionally, they can cause psychological harm. A study done by the American Psychological Association, Association showed that discrimination can exacerbate stress, and specifically, discrimination-related stress is linked to mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. And even more than that, Hispanic and black individuals um, stated that they were more likely to feel a need to take care of their appearance in order to get good service at a restaurant or to avoid racial harassment. So with that background, um, the hair guidance document that DCR issued stated that employers, housing providers, and places of public of accommodations um, are prohibited from implementing policies that explicitly banned hairstyles that are associated with black racial, cultural, or ethnic identity. For example, a, a school um, policy that bans locks or braids may be prohibited. Additionally, any policy that seems racially neutral, um, it can't be selectively enforced or more harshly applied to black hairstyles. So a school that has a policy related to hair length that is only enforced against black students with braids, that would be prohibited. Additionally, a policy that calls for, say, a, a tidy appearance or a neat appearance, but somehow is only applied to dreadlocks, or dreadlocks are always not tidy or not neat, that would also be prohibited. So specifically here, um, we're specific to you, rule 4.2.1, is a length rule, it's not a style rule, so it can't be interpreted in a way that penalizes black wrestlers based on their black hairstyle. So does this mean that black hairstyles are exempt? Um, can they be policed at all? Um, yes, they, they're still subject to grooming rules and policies so long as the policies are based on a legitimate reason, like a safety concern. Um, and they're not based on stereotypes. The goal is to make sure that people understand grooming standards and policies have to be applied in an even-handed manner. Um, they shouldn't be used as a means of pressuring people with black hairstyles to conform to European standards. So what are some ways you can prevent stereotypes from influencing your judgment calls or influencing your interpretation of a rule? Number one, Become aware of your biases. We all have biases. We're, we're all walking around with them. Some of, them are, some of us are aware of them and some of us aren't. Um, but think about what are some assumptions you make when you see someone with a certain hairstyle? What, what are these assumptions based on? There are tests online that you can take called implicit association tests and it'll help you identify what some of your biases are. Um, the next thing is Become aware of your, once you become aware of your biases, make sure you challenge them. Question your first impressions of people. Make sure your initial impression is based on your actual knowledge of a situation and not just a stereotype or a prejudgment. For example, if you see an athlete with cornrows who 
you all, you know, just get a, an idea that person's a dirty player, they're gonna break the rules. Stop and think, has this person said or done something that makes me believe this? Or do I just automatically associate cornrows with uh, the type of person who would break the rules? Similarly, if you, if you see an athlete with locks um, and you immediately assume his hair must be dirty or must have some sort of foreign objects in it, stop and observe, actually evaluate what's in front of you and determine whether that's actually the truth or whether it's just based on some assumption or a stereotype. Um, and finally, whenever possible, I, I know you're officials, so this may not always be possible, but when possible, avoid making spur of the moment decisions. Um, when we're trying to process things quickly, we revert and fall back on whatever stereotypes we have because it's just easier and faster than fully evaluating um, all of the evidence in front of us. So if you need any additional information on the Memorandum of Understanding or the Hair Guidance Document or just the LAD in general, that's our website, njcivilrights.com, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> .gov, njcivilrights.gov, or you can call us, that's our Newark office number, 973-648-2700. Um, I also have extra copies of the MOU if anybody's interested in those. I don't know if you would be, but I do have some if you would like. And if for some reason this is your first interaction, your first time hearing um, of DCR, we, it, or any, you feel like you've been subjected to discrimination or harassment or retaliation in violation of the LAD, just for your knowledge, you can file a lawsuit in court um, within two years or you can file a complaint directly with DCR within 180 days. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Joe, get first. Yeah, I'm definitely. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for coming. To, yeah, man, I'm not going to use this thing. <clears throat> gentlemen, thanks for uh, coming tonight. And uh, I know it's been a lot of changes. Um, I just bless you that tonight was that blessed for you to meet these students and that. And I just want to say we're very sorry. As as we can with all these new rules, there's plenty of them. Uh, just a couple thoughts beforehand. I got Tony's here, as, as we explained earlier, he's the section one representative for about seven, eight states. There'll be a lot of communication between he and I this year that we have New Jersey's on the same page with the other states. Also, I'm trying to get within this month a meeting with, or actually a, a two hour meeting with uh, the seven interpreters, because each, each chapter has its own interpreter, a few other officials. We're gonna go over some situations, try to, try to kind of get things out and we're gonna relay that to all the chapters, the chapter interpreter. During the season, the rule that you're gonna go by is you're gonna go, if you have a question in your chapter, go to your interpreter first. They'll be in touch with me. I'll be in touch with above if I need a, a further ruling. But there'll be like a protocol you can work with. Um, Mark can give you my email address, my cell phone number, you can have that. I have no problem with that. But we're, we're gonna kind of be communicative if, if like, the Upper North Jersey has a ruling that we're going to do on. You're going to also hear it down here. All the other seven chapters will. We'll try to get the communication up. All right, for this year. The first rule we're going to, you're going to come to, the female contestants must have a form-fitted compression suitable undergarment that completely covers the breast. Right, and it has to be tight fitting. What you're gonna do, if, you, if you're at a match, and you're gonna have to ask if you have a female wrestler gonna be take part of the, of the male 
of that. It's not going to be just a, a female uh, dual meet. Obviously, they're going to be weighing in and they're going to be skin checked. You're not going to be there for it. At the time, what you're going to do your pre-meet duties, that's when you're going to invite any female wrestler and after you've already done the skin check for the guys. If you have to do the skin check for your male wrestlers because there's no trainer there that's going to do it, do your skin check, then invite the female wrestler in. So in other words, you're going to give one uh, pre-meet talk to them all. And this way you can see whether she's got a garment on that's going to be tight fitting at that time. You don't want to come to the mat when she appears and you're going to have to do something there. So at that point in time, if she doesn't, she doesn't wrestle. The questions, we're going to try to, I'm going to try to roll it through. If you have some questions, kind of write it down. We'll go over it after. You also have your interpreter, your, your chapter interpreter can help because we had a meeting on the 24th where we were all there. But you can hold them and I'll try to go through it first. If you have your, if you have your rule book, you can go to page 15. It's already highlighted. I'm going to mark the page or mark the rule, page and rule book it's going to refer to. A suitable undergarment which completely covers the buttocks and groin area shall be worn in one piece singlet. So again this year, both male and female wrestlers must have a suitable undergarment under the singlet that covers the groin and buttocks area. Again, the ruling for that is if you, some of the uniforms are white with sweat, they can be kind of transparent at that time. So they, again, they must have a suitable undergarment. The one piece thing that may be worn with folding tights, again on page, page 15, ladies and gentlemen, that's article one. It's all highlighted. Again, the female contestants wearing one piece thing that shall wear a form fitted compression super gar undergarment that completely covers their breasts. Rationale, the rule proposal reinforces the importance of how wrestlers should be required to properly attire in a mat during competition regardless of gender. Currently, there is no specific requirement for what a wrestler wears under a singlet. Light colored or white singlets become transparent if an undergarment is not worn underneath. This creates a modesty concern that athletes are revealing more than is appropriate. And there's a picture of a suitable undergarment which completely covers the buttocks and groin should be worn under shorts. A legal uniform consists of compression shorts designed for wrestling shall. There's, if you look at the rule book, there's a whole bunch of gap in there. The snaps are towards the end of it. But again, that's on page 15. Where's my book? Compression shorts or shorts designed for us may be worn with a form-fitted compression shirt. Compression shorts or shorts designed for us and shall be school issued. Rule now requires a suitable undergarment to be worn under compression shorts. Light colored white compression shorts become transparent if an undergarment is not worn underneath. So there's the male on the side with the, with the um, suitable undergarment and a female on the right side. Female contestants wearing a one piece singlet shall wear a suitable undergarment that covers their breasts and minimizes the risk of exposure. All contestants wearing a one-piece singlet shall wear a suitable undergarment which completely covers the buttocks and groin. So that's the highlight of this new rule. Undergarment, suitable undergarment, covers the buttocks and groin for both male and female. And for the female, a compression for the, covers the breast completely. All right, the next rule change. Sho shoelaces. That's on page 16 in your rule book. This year, if the shoelaces come untied, it's an automatic warning for stalling. I know in the past that we had, if the wrestler came to the mat, and you blew the whistle, and they were fine, and the shoelace became untied during wrestling, we allowed it, we allowed it to go, it wasn't any change. This year, if he becomes untied, it's a, a warning for stalling. 
if it's under the the wrap or the tie and that cut, that drops or that becomes loose, that is not a penalty for warning for stalling. The, the actual shoelace must become untied. So when you're doing your pre-meet duty, you might want to tell them that this year the shoelaces must be the lace tape strapped. If they come undone this year, it's going to be a penalty, war, a penalty or warning for stalling wherever you are in the chart. Wrestler so wear light heelless wrestling shoes. The la we'll go, I'll skip down about the laces are visible. They should be, sec be secure in an acceptable fashion. The shoelaces come undone. The penalty would be an automatic stalling call. This year is a big emphasis to hold the coach accountable and wrestler that they come properly equipped. That appears over and over in the, the parts of new rules. So when you're asking the coach and the premier dude, everybody properly attired, they're attesting this year more than ever before. No. Then it becomes to the wrestler. The accountability is that before, when he's attesting that they are, if the, if the wrestler comes out and his shoelaces are undone, where is his accountability that he's attesting that they all should be there? You know, in the past, I know I have it with soccer too, they all say everybody's fine. This year, they're supposed to be paying more attention that the, the wrestler is properly uniformed and ready to wrestle. The first go, yellow card goes to the coach and the others go to, right, no. Right, this, this new rule that's been changed does not affect this year. Right, just throw that, you don't, have to pay, you don't have to pay attention to logos on the headgear. Okay, the hair rule. So it starts on page 16 in your book. The hair and picks A and B are legal. The hair rule in this, the hair is longer than allowed. A legally controlled vice such as a rubber band shall be secured. So this year, uh, you'll see, well, I'll, we'll see it in a minute. Hold on. The hair pick in A and B is legal. You got a control device in B. The hair is longer than allowed. Legal hair control is such a rubber band shall be secured. The hair and pick A and B is legal. All right. In the new rule, you'll see they've gotten rid of the part that says trimmed and well-groomed, the hair in its natural state. During competition, all wrestlers shall be clean-shaven and cybers trimmed no lower than the earlobe level. Here is where it is. It shall not extend below the top of an ordinary shirt collar on the back and on the sides. The hair shall not extend below earlobe level. In the front, the hair shall not extend beyond the eyebrows. The, the trim mustache, mustache that does not extend. So this year, the rule is all about the length, not about hairstyles, all about the length. So if it's longer than b below the collar on the sides, then they're going to have to have to tie it up or in a hair cover. What was that? The hair length trumps everything. Right. Yep. We'll get to that in a minute. There's one thing against that. Yep. Yep. All right. Physical hair treatment items that are hard and abrasive, such as beads, bobby pins, barrettes, pins, hair clips, etc or any hair, hair control device shall not be permitted. A legal hair, hair, hair control device such as rubber band shall be secured as not to come out readily during wrestling. So in that one where it says physical treatments, if it's abrasive, hard, that can't, that has to be under hair cover. So in other words, if, he, if the person meets the length and still is abrasive or hard, that needs a hair cover. That should answer your question then. Greasy substance too, correct. 
We'll get to that in a second, rubber band. Legal hair cover shall be attached to ear guards at the site. If an individual has facial hair, it shall be covered with a face mask. All legal hair cover face masks will be considered as special equipment. If an individual hair is a brace for an unshaved face, the individual shall be required to shave the head and smooth the face required to wear a legal hair cover. Well-groomed was extremely subjective. That's what was removed in the rule. That one work. Well, it, it, I saw that somewhere when the chief and her all these started, and they said they won't let me. So it's not. You need a regular face face mask for that face guard. So we're going to that means we're going to have a little confrontation with the coach because the coach was pretty adamant that it's good. Describe what you're saying again, because I think both of you are on a different page here. He's thinking something different than you're saying. Okay. Is that is it that? There's a face mask that is like a, almost a cheap cap that kind of uh, ties in under here and covers the thing. It's not a hard face mask. But no, it's, it's not. It's soft. Yeah. But he, but he was kind of saying that it was yeah, a regular hair cover that he just extended. It actually comes down and covers the beard. And, and ties it's the in hair the cover. The hair was the the hair was up to the ball. Uh, he had the hair cover on. Like it's your, like it's. Um, they, they make they make a soft mask that covers the beard and ties in under. And I think Joe would say that was going to be okay. It's not that hard plastic rubber. No, rubber it's not face. hard, but it, it. But he's saying uh, what we're. But it sounds like he's saying this was something that was modified. He's taking off the hair cover, it's modified. Made to be a face mask. Is it made to be a face mask though? It's made to be not a face. It's not a face. Yeah, it's not covering the face. Just covering the side, like it's your, like it's your flap for cold weather. But he's not tying it underneath. It's just one side, one piece. No, he's tying. He's it tying underneath. Yeah. yeah. Sure, Joe has it. Uh, there was a kid from North Bergen. It was the first one I saw. He has a soft, uh, it's like a mask, it's soft uh, material that covers his beard. It, it attaches to the head here and it attaches here. It's not a face mask over here, it just covers the beard. Fine by us. Uh, last year we looked at it and everything else. So, again, don't think of a face mask as a hard coated thing. It could be a new thing. Um, colleges, I guess, some of them might be wearing it, but. Um, it's a soft material and it's not tied under here. It's one continuous piece that goes around here. So you'll get it that, that way. Does the best way I can describe it is remember uh, Ralphie's from uh, Christmas Story yes. with the hat with the flap come down yeah. and tied underneath? That's exactly the way it was. All right, for the rubber band, if we pass the film. This year, if the person has longer hair than it's allowed, they're allowed to put it on the top in a rubber band, tied it and secured by a rubber band. If that rubber band comes undone, there is no penalty. And it can come undone in numerous times. It, there's no penalty for that. I know Mark sent out to you some of the questions we had, and I'll just address one while you're here. If a wrestler is wearing a turban, what's he or she need to wear a hair cover in order to be legal? The wearing of the turban suggests that this is a religious issue, and I recommend that you make the most reasonable accommodation possible. However, the rule is intended to protect the wrestler's ears and no injury hazard to their opponent. The ear guards have to be worn. Possibly a hair cover covering may be suitable, may be substituted for the turban. Consider using acceptable hair, co hair control devices in place and legal cover might suffice. Basically what he's saying there is they may need a, a turban, may need a hair cover on there. 
If a wrestler is wearing their hair up in a bun and during the course of an offensive move, the wrestler unintendedly grabs and possibly uses to assist an offensive move, there's a, is there a penalty? Yes, it is a technical violation. It should be penalized like grabbing headgear or uniform. The technical violation, unless the head is moved past normal range of motion, it's illegal. Unnecessary roughness can be called. So if the person has it up in a bun, you can't be using that to grab for a move, even accidentally. In a scenario where the offensive wrestler in the top position is wrestling, a defensive wrestler has their hair in a bun secured by a rubber band on top of their head, what would happen if the course of wrestling at the rubber band snaps and strikes the eye of the top wrestler? I would say we have an injury time, and what would be the call if the offensive wrestler can't continue? Will there be any liabilities in this scenario? His answer was, injury time is a correct call. I'm not sure the liability would be any different than a wrestler who hurts their opponent using a legal move. It would be an accident, just like legal equipment breaking and hurting the opponent. We do not recommend scrunchies because they do not hold up on the rigors of wrestling. We are not prescriptive in, on the thickness or length of the rubber band because we would have officials measuring the width and length of said rubber band, and we do not want that. Plus, it's very bad for us. Again, the okay. So that's that's a couple questions we asked and clarify. Arm sleeves and leg sleeves. I know last year we were making sure if we had an arm sleeve, it, it didn't go melt much past. We, we try to keep to a certain length. This year, leg sleeves and arm sleeves are only legal if they have padding for the elbow or the knee. If there is no padding, they're not legal in any situation. Wrestlers shall not wear wristbands, sweatbands, bicep bands, or leg or arm sleeves that do not contain a pad during a match. It's on page 18 if you want to follow that. Page 19, at way and female contestants shall wear a suitable form-fitted compression undergarment that completely covers their breasts. Mostly if you're going to a match, it's going to be covered by some female in that, in that school, not by us. All contestants shall weigh in wearing a suitable undergarment that completely covers the buttocks and groin like we were said before, and the female contestant should have a suitable fit compression undergarment that completely covers their breasts. All right, takedown rule, 525, page 29. And before in the past, last year's rule that we said if the person braces with their hand or hands, it's got to be fully supporting of their weight, that was taken out. If the person, the takedown should be awarded when one or both knees defensive wrestler are touching the mat beyond reaction time or when the defenses legs or torso are controlled and the wrestler's hands so I'll touch the mat beyond reaction time. So if I'm going down, I'm bracing, and it's behind reaction time, what's reaction time? Use the same thing for locked hands. If the person's on the top and they come to the bottom, use that reaction times also. So it's taken away the rule that it's gotta be the majority of the weight is borne on that supporting point. It's just beyond reaction time. I would say fingers would count too, yep. Takedown should be worn by one or both knees. The defensive wrestler are touching the mat behind reaction time when defenses are controlled. This rule eliminates that double standard created when the definition of takedown was revised last year. So now we have a double standard rule book. To be consistent, we need to say that whenever the hands touch the mat, they are considered supporting points. By removal of the majority of the wrestler's weight criteria, we will eliminate the need for the fish to make a judgment call on weight-bearing extremities. Page 20 on 29, this is the picture that's a little, this, this picture doesn't really, well, there's going to be a difference this year for, for a technical violation and stalling. You're going to issue a technical violation if in the course of wrestling, and we'll get to a couple pictures, 
the person leaves the mat area to avoid scoring, imminent scoring. This picture is that the defense wrestler goes out of bounds, wrestling area to avoid imminent scoring situation, technical violation. When we had our meeting on the 24th, we didn't determine this picture was really imminent scoring. This was actually stalling. There are five types of technical violation. Each is penalized without a warning, intentionally going out of the wrestling area, forcing opponent of the wrestling area to avoid imminent scoring situation is a technical violation this year. The reason behind it last year, we had people were trying to figure out whether it's a TV fleeing the mat or whether it, whether it was stalling. So this year, to make it easy, if the person flees the mat, goes out of the wrestling area to prevent being scoring, to prevent being scored upon, it's a technical violation, which is a point right away. Any other situation, it's a stalling, whether it be warning or a point. The rationale was go to the bottom. The technical violation has been underutilized for years, and hopefully this will give officials the tools and confidence to, to distinguish between it and stalling. Going out of the wrestling area, forcing an opponent out of the wrestling area by either wrestler at any time as a means of avoiding an imminent scoring situa situation is a technical violation of fleeing the mat. Both wrestlers should make every effort to remain in bounds. When the referee feels that either wrestler has failed to make every effort to stay in bounds during an imminent scoring situation, the offending wrestler shall be penalized for fleeing the mat. That was another question we gave them in our meeting. What's the question for imminent scoring? Definite imminent scoring, we spent a lot of time on this in the rule that's on 24th. Is it a technical violation or, or stalling? We need a definition what imminent scoring was. The answer back from, from Elliot Hopkins was, it's a technical violation because you're avoiding to be scored upon. While the NFHS rule book does not define imminent under rule five of definitions, the concept is the same as something that's about to happen. This will be a judgment call by the referee just like the imminent near fall. When we get together with the seven interpreters and a few other officials, that's one of the things we're gonna go by to help maybe define more black and white to you what imminent scoring is. If you have case book, look at page 47. 7.3.1. You wanna read it? Tell me, I don't have the case book. This has always been this, this pertains to this, and we've always kind of, you know when a kid's got a leg up in the air and a kid dives and he goes out of bounds and we've kind of taken the, well, he's got no place else to go. Can't dive back in, he's got to go out. Well, that's kind of out nowadays. Here's what it says. Wrestler A has one leg of wrestler B in the air and B intentionally goes out of bounds. What call should the referee make in this situation? Ruling. Is a technical violation fleeing when a wrestler intentionally goes out of bounds, uh, goes out of the wrestling area and forces, or forces an opponent out of the wrestling area uh, as a means to, of avoiding Im an imminent scoring situation? In this case, wrestler B in this situation would be penalized one point for a technical violation. So this kind of paints a picture in black and white that what we used to say, you know, a kid's got the leg up in the air and he dive, and the other kid dives out of bounds and pulls out of bounds. Well, he's got nowhere else to go. Well, this year he's got to find a different place to go or he's going to be penalized. It's black and white. It's in a rule book. You don't want to call it, you call it, but you should be calling it. If he breaks, listen, if in the neutral position of a person backing out of bounds. I know last year there were a lot of us were maybe giving the kid one chance or it was within the first 10 seconds, you're not gonna give him a chance. We're gonna be discussing that, that this year we wanna enforce that if they back up, no matter whether it's two seconds or three seconds, and he's not being forced out, he's actually kind of backing out at his leisure, you're gonna penalize him for stalling. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit more black and white cause, than last year, because I know most of us were giving a guy a second chance. All right, there goes about the stalling when the shoelace become undone. Again, the rule holds the coach and wrestler accountable to verification that they have come to the mat properly equipped. 
All right, penalties and warnings are cumulative throughout the match. Each infraction has a specific penalty. The penalty for illegal and hold maneuver technical violation, except for false start or incorrect starting position, necessary roughness and wrestlers unsportsmanlike kind of match is awarding the opponent of the offender one match point in the first and second offenses and two match on the third. Fourth offense will be in disqualification. The first two calls for a false start or incorrect starting position will receive cautions. This is nothing different than last year. I, I did mention it. All right. Again, just reinforce on the shoelace. If it comes, un, it comes undone when it comes off the Velcro, that is, as long as the shoelace does not become untied, it's no penalty. Now, you might want to do some preventive officiating. If I know a lot of kids, their Velcro is like going back to 1920s. It's, just, it's very loose. You might want to take an official timeout and have that tape wrapped or have that wrapped. But again, if you're doing your pre-meet, you say, listen, if that shoelace comes undone, if it falls out of your, your wrap and it's undone at that time, you're going to get penalized. You might want to consider taping that. Also, the same thing, all shoes should be laced to the top. There shouldn't be two eyelids missing on there, too, so the shoe doesn't come out of the kid's foot. So when you're into doing that pre-meet, say that all the eyelids all the, must be laced to the top, and it should be taped or laced because if it comes undone, it's going to be a stalling call. All right, new, new, here's, a big, here's the newest, biggest one for that, the penalty chart and stalling. There's going to be two different ones. Now the stalling is going to have its own penalty chart, the technical violations, the lock hands, that's all going to be a second one. The rationale was behind this was that officials may call it stalling a lot more quickly or a lot when it's, when it's there as opposed to maybe if you're, at, if you're at a, let's say if you had a locked hands for one, a legal hold for two, would be another one point, and maybe you're up at the locked hands again, so you got a 1-1-2. One, one, now the person stalled, you have a warning. Now that he's kind of stalling again, some of the officials wouldn't call that because he'd be DQ'd. So now you have a separate chart for stalling and a separate chart for all the other violations. Same thing as warning, 1-1-2, one, one, choice, and then he's out. Warnings and penalty for slaughter and cumulative throughout the match and the penalized independent progressive penalty chart. In the first offense, we're only receive a warning. The opponent of the offender will be awarded one match point in the second and third offense, two match points in choice position on the next restart for the fourth offense and the fifth offense will be gone. That's a chart in your rule book. You can't really see it here. It's page 42 in your rule book. Again, the rationale for separating the two, the officials need to call stalling more consistently in order to increase the level of aggressive offensive wrestling. By removing stalling from the progressive penalty sequence, the officials will be able to penalize wrestlers more freely without complicating the matter when it's combined with other penalties, locked hands, fleeing, grasping, clothing, etc. Removing a stolen call from the penalty progression will allow officials more freedom to call stolen earlier, more consistently and without hesitation when they feel is warranted. We kind of talked, or Tony and I talked when we, when we met ourselves, that it may also increase stalling. So if I'm in the third period and now I've got some points to give and I'm not in a progressive chart, I may kind of stall for the last couple minutes because it's completely off the chart. So. In essence, what they're trying to bring out sometimes may look like it's not working because now I can give, if I, I'm ahead by four points, I can give three stallings, where if it was on the regular or one chart, I wasn't able to do that. Yep. Just when I, was in, when I was out in Indianapolis, you know, this thing came up and we changed it this year. The intent here was uh, that more stalling be called if it's there, obviously. And they felt that some officials were shy about calling stalling because it could add in with another penalty if a kid clasped or something like that. And before you know it, D you were DQing a kid. Um, so the intent here was to try to have more stalling being called. If you look in your rule book and your case book, uh, stalling, there's more stuff dedicated to stalling than any other topic in wrestling. There are nine pages that 
have reference to stalling, talk about stalling in between the two books, six in the rule book, three in the case book. Um, so it wasn't that they didn't want the wrong impression to come out, and that's what I'm saying here. They don't want people to back off stalling. And, and in fact, you know, uh, a lot we, in Jersey, we used to be probably one of the higher. I, I, I kind of get the impression now we're, we're kind of falling a little behind. The rest of the states have picked it up quite a bit. So, uh, but again, the intent here was to try to make it easier to make the stall call, not to uh, take it away. All right, the next new rule is injury time. When an athlete suffers a suspected injury involving the head, neck, cervical column, and or nervous system only, an appropriate healthcare professional is present. The referee shall give the signal to indicate evaluation time be extended to five minutes. So you're there, when you arrive at the site, you might want to find out if they do have, in most cases, an appropriate healthcare professional there. Sometimes they're bouncing between basketball and wrestling. Sometimes they're just there for you. So if you are a trainer, right? So therefore, if you have someone there and you suspect they have the head, neck, cervical, nervous system, you will start, that's the new, new signal, we are up at the forehead, that would start a five minute time, not a one and a half injury time. If, this, if the person is not there at the time that you suspect they could have a head, cervical, neck issue, you start the regular injury clock. I think, Gary, you asked me that question on this one. You start the regular injury talk. The trainer or the health professional then comes in. You call them to the mat. If they think they want additional time to do this, it then goes to the five-minute uh, evaluation time. You don't, and that automatically switches. The whole time switches to the five-minute evaluation. So there's no one-and-a-half injury time that was used. Again, the person's got to be there, and the person wants a five-minute evaluation time. The second time that you suspect that the person has a head, neck, cervical, uh, nervous system, they're finished. There is no second time. No, no. Nope. Again, if you suspect that, no. That would be the two minute recovery time. Any contestant exhibit signs, symptoms, or behaviors consistent with a concussion, such as loss of consciousness, head, headache, dizziness, confusion, balance problems, shall be immediately removed from the match and shall not return competition until cleared by appropriate health care professional. That's the same as with last year. The following modification injury timeouts will be used in all competition regarding injuries to head and neck involving cervical and or nervous system. In the absence of appropriate health care professional, physician, or certified athletic trainer, all injuries to the head and neck involving a cervical column and our nervous system will be covered in the same frame, time frame as other injuries, which is that one and a half minute I was mentioned. When appropriate healthcare professionals are present, they have the jurisdiction to extend the allow, allowed time limit to a maximum of five minutes for evaluation injuries to the head and neck involving cervical column and or nervous system only, at which time the athlete would, not, would be required to prepare without delay for continuation or default to match. So again, if they hurt their leg, this doesn't apply. It's only head, neck, cervical, nervous system. A second occurrence of injury to head, neck, and involving cervical column and or central nervous system in the same match shall require the wrestler to default the match. When this provision is used, the time consumed for all the injury will no way affect time used or available for other types of injuries. So again, if you start that on the one and a half minutes because that trainer is not there, they come there, want the time, it just switches to that five minutes. No, the school has to have, it's the school one. The same thing we talked about, Tony and I were talking before, sometimes schools bring their own trainer, the visiting school brings their own trainer. The home team will trump that person. Then we, we, we said that, didn't we say that doesn't, well, you said that out in Kansas City, correct?
Well, did, did they say out there they could take somebody from the stands up? That's that's real gray hair. We're going that question I'll ask out Elliot whether the person can be taken out of the stands because I know in the past that was not the case. The person had to be designated by the home team. I'll get that clarified and that'll be out to you. We'll get that clarified. All right, the rule changes. The rule change allows additional time to evaluate concussions when appropriate health care provider is present. If one is not present, the regular injury time is used. It can only be used once to avoid fake injuries. Recovery and blood time are not extended under this new rule. It cannot be used for any other type of injuries. Yes? Yeah, the home team trumps, so we're going to get that clarified again for you. That's definitely, that's written in black and white. Right, we're live, we're live. <clears throat> All right, again, we're going to, I'll contact that. We'll get that clarified, who trumps who. If the visiting team has somebody, can they grab somebody from out of stands? We'll get that re-clarified for us. All right, new rule for team scoring. The dual meet ends with a team tied score. The tiebreaker went to the fifth criteria, forfeits. Since the home team forfeited more bouts than the guest, the guest wins the duel. This kind of got, uh, supposedly the, the, where this rule came into play was some coaches who had maybe a, a couple studs coming up in the lineup were going to maybe get first points because they could see a tie match coming, so they just forfeited this. That, that, that kind of got rid of that. So again, the sixth criteria, it would be after the fifth criteria, it would be forfeits. In dual meet competition, teams have identical scores. The following team, the following team tie breaking system be used to determine the winner. The team giving up the least number of forfeits criteria should be relabeled. I'll give you that page in a second. Hold on, Tom. Page 48. What do you got? All right, here's the thing on the healthcare professional. It's in the rule book. This is, this is what it says in the case book, page 62, uh, rule 825. Uh, goes through the situation. Then it says ruling. The designated on-site meet appropriate healthcare professional provided by the host school shall have final authority. It talks about if the visitor brings their own, okay? Um, it also says, uh, yeah, the designated home care professional. And it doesn't really say in the stands, but it says, it said, uh, I just read it now, I can't find it. Go on, and if I find it, we'll come back. Rule change maintains that forfeit should not be encouraged by rules that give the forfeiting team an advantage. Teams should be encouraged to put a rest on the mat, weight on the mat for every weight class, not penalized by the likelihood of giving up scoring events counting against them. Editorial changes. If you go to page 30, there is no Article 6. It stops at Article 5. This is Article 6 that would be kind of written in if you want to do it. Head and neck cervical column if a contestant is injured and the, and the on-site appropriate health care professional determines that additional time is needed to evaluate the wrestler's head, neck, and involving the cervical column and or a central nervous system, the wrestler is entitled to five minutes, which is not deducted from the injured wrestler's previous injury time allowance. Second occurrence of the injury to head and neck involving a cerebral column will default the match. 
All right, points of emphasis. I said before, the head coach has the obligation to ensure that each wrestler is properly equipped in a proper uniform. Furthermore, he or she or the adult is responsible that each wrestler's skin, nails, and hair are suitable and compliant for competition. Regarding the uniform wrestler's appearance, we are experiencing modesty challenges which, have, which re reflect negatively on the sport. Both genders shall wear suitable undergarments to completely cover the buttocks and groin area. Especially in the school issue, the uniform is light colored or white once it becomes wet from the perspiration, which we did before. Stalling pictures. This is more stalling. Forcing the opponent off the mat or fleeing the mat to avoid wrestling, A and B, are considered stalling, must be penalized. So in this, this point, the offensive wrestler is lifting the defensive wrestler off the mat. Wrestling is an aggressive endeavor and should be coached in an executed manner. It's expected the wrestler shall stay in bounds and compete. No passive wrestling. Backing off the mat, out of bounds, pushing or pulling the opponent out of bounds, hands locked around the leg of an opponent without the intent of taking him or her down or preventing the opponent from scoring is considered stalling. The referee shall be firm and consistent in enforcing the letter and spirit of the rule. Two injury timeouts that do not exceed one minute, 30 seconds are allowed. This is just like re, re, kind of going old rules. Contestant is injured result of a legal hold maneuver such as a slam. Recovery time is not deducted from the injured contestant's injury time allowance. He's got two minutes recovery time for each occurrence. Uh, concussion evaluation time extension. We've talked about this. It's got five minutes if there's a health appropriate health care professional there. If a healthcare professional is there, a trainer, correct? Yes. Yep. If a coach says that to me, I let him do it. Yep. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go against it. Yeah. Yeah. Be ethical, the coach. If he wants to give him a five-minute break, yes. No. All right, another points of emphasis, sporting behavior. Contestants are expected to exhibit proper sporting behavior before, during, and after matches, whether engaging with referees or opponents. Referees must penalize improper behavior. Sportsmanship and for enforcement. Oh. Another point of emphasis this year, too, when you do your pre-meet duties, you must read that sportsmanship card in its entirety. It will not suffice for the announcer to read it out there when the contestants come out there. So your first part of your pre-meet duty is to read that whole sportsmanship card. Not, not sub-phrase it or paraphrase it in your own words. Read it entirely. Especially this year when, every, when we're under the microscope, especially wrestling, especially state of New Jersey, you want to make sure if it's asked that you read that, you want to make sure you have read that. And I cannot really enforce that enough or tell you enough, it's got to be read. And that's why I said before, if there's a female wrestler wrestling on the male team because there's no female wrestling match, make sure after you do the skin check for the guys that you bring the female wrestler. Again, you got to get clearance that the locker room is gonna, not going to have any other boys coming in there, that she's there and hears that too. Yep, all levels, freshman, JV, varsity. If you're doing eighth grade, I would still think it'd be a good idea to read it there, too. It's not going to hurt them. I know in soccer, we got half the officials have it memorized. What was that? No, but I'm going to look, because I know in soccer, we have the card that's laminated. I'll, I'll work with Bill. Maybe we'll be able to get that and get one out to everybody. Yeah, it's back. Right. The lessons learned in the competition matter supports and underpinnings of developing young person, a conscientious and responsible adult. Remember, sports is supposed to be the extension of the classroom. Finally, the wrestler is ultimately responsible for his or her behavior and decorum. To gain a victory by using sportsmanship moves or techniques only masks the temporary exhila exhilaration of the win. The success becomes hollow and will eventually lose the joy of competing, which is not the purpose of high school athletics. Working collectively by promoting good sportship, we can increase the number of opportunities for more people to participate in the sport at very levels. 
we don't get much into hydration. Proper hydration prevents the rest from being weighed in Loma. This is really the coaches. If that's what they're doing right, once you start the weighing, as Bill was saying, once you start the weighing, if you're doing, if you happen to be doing it for a dual meet, which most of us don't, but a tournament, they cannot go out and drink right there or go out somewhere and, and pee or use the bathroom. They have to stay in that room. And also, you're going to be, going back to reading the sportsmanship card, for tournaments, you're going to have to gather everybody together and read that card for the tournament uh, contestants, too. And also, you're going to want to check the hair, skin, nails for all in tournaments also. I know in some case, some tournaments hire us officials to do that before. It may be hard this year to get that because they may not want the cost. But somehow, you're going to have to get to all the contestants before you start a tournament that they're all checked. Hair, nails, skin, read the sportsmanship card. And so therefore, when you're in that locker room or in the tournament, you want to make sure that all the contestants are there. Check with the coaches that nobody's missing. That's hydration. That's it. That's the, that's the rules. The only signal is the one for the forehead for the five minutes. Well, yes, you can, but you have the legal backing. If that provided home school health care professional said that the wrestlers were able to go, do I necessarily want to trump it? But in essence, yes, you can, but you want to be very careful with that. If for some reason you think they're missing, I would talk to the trainer on the side and say, listen, I, I think he bumped his head. You, you really want to check him out? because I have some doubts, but you want to really take that person to the side, he or she, and talk to them. Mark, you good to take it? Where's Mark? Mark, you good to take any questions in your own? Exactly. Somebody have a question for me? No, Mark, 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 yeah, no, to see what he, no. You good? You can take it from here, because that's it. Okay. I'd like to thank Joe for the rules. Thanks for coming. Southern Shore, you're excused if you'd like. I'd be willing to call that athletic director if you're having a situation where the coach is not being held accountable, why don't you just contact me at the office and I'll make that nasty phone call down to the AD. I'll promise you that much, okay? Because we really want to prevent what transpired last year. Quite frankly, I wish I had known that at a prior tournament that the young man was not properly outfitted. I would have been on the phone with that AD and hopefully had dealt with it. But if that's the case, if you want me to hold him accountable, just contact me, okay? I'll do my part. I agree with you, but however, however, it doesn't hurt for somebody like myself to reach out to that AD to make sure his coach is doing his job, okay? So again, Mark, I can give, you, give anybody who wants my cell phone number and email address to do it, but again, your route's gonna go to your local uh, interpreter to give to me. You're fine.